So I'm Paulo Shakarian. I am an uh, assistant professor at Arizona State, and I'm also the CEO of a small company called Intellispire that we've spun out of research from my lab. So in a prior life, I used to work intelligence. And when we would evaluate a threat, we would consider what capabilities that they have. And after I went to grad school and entered academia, I thought more and more about what are the shortcomings of how we think about cyber? And why don't we consider the threat in the same way we do in other domains? So here we see uh, the Guy Fox mask, trade, uh, trademark of the hacking group Anonymous. And this leads me to think of this idea that there's a little bit of a disconnect in cybersecurity. So we know about Anonymous. We know about Russian hackers, RBN. We know about what nation states have what capabilities. So we know who these guys are, and we have an idea of their capabilities. Yet at the same time, reactive techniques dominate. If you look at state-of-the-art in most research, what most of the new uh, cyber startup companies are doing, what the big companies are focused on, they're looking at things like insider threat, detecting breaches, incident response, malware reverse engineering. All of these things are inherently reactive in nature. Now, I'm not saying they're not important. Don't get me wrong. They certainly are. But I think we have a little bit uh, too much focus on reacting to things as opposed to being proactive and considering what can the threat actually do to me. So again, here's the uh, statue from Estonia. And of course, this was an attack that occurred. Uh, at the time, there was some knowledge about the capabilities of Russian hackers. And there was, of course, uh, you know, we did know about what the political situation was at the time. Yet, even now, this is about, what now, nine years since this incident occurred, we still have trouble answering the following questions. You know, who is attacking? The cyber attribution question. We've been talking about this also for years. Why are they attacking? What are their motivations? An example I like to often bring up here is if you consider another Russian cyber attack against Georgia in 2008, if you consider what their strategic objectives were, which was to take Georgian media and government sites offline, you could understand in the broader context why they didn't do things like, in that case, attack infrastructure. Because they had limited strategic goals. What actions will they take? How do we determine the best course of action for a cyber adversary? And finally, how do they obtain their cyber weapons? Where do they come from? And this also feeds into the notion of what their capabilities are. So why do we have trouble answering these questions? Is it a lack of data? Or is it our ability to make sense of it? I would say that a lot of it has to do with our ability to make sense of it. I think there's actually no shortage of data. We have system logs, we look at network traffic, we have host data. Uh, later on in this talk, I'll talk about data that we can gather by studying the threat. So let me give you an example here of a shortcoming of our analysis. So this is a picture from Capture the Flag contest that was held in DEF CON a few years back. And we studied this. In this Capture the Flag, there were 20 teams that participated. And each one was trying to hack into systems of the other teams to capture flags. Now, if we look at each of these 20 teams, and we look at every time they were attacked, we can maybe try to f see if, based on the data we have, if we can properly identify the attacker. So from a data science perspective, this seems like it should be an easy problem. 
But when we actually did this, and we spent a lot of time using standard machine learning approaches, we obtained 37% accuracy. So granted, this is better than random guessing, but still not very good. The type of analysis that is commonly done throughout data science for things like recommender systems, uh, how, you, how you get videos or products referred to you when you go to Amazon or Netflix, don't necessarily apply here. Now, why is this? Well, we did some secondary analysis on the results, and we categorized the types of attacks into several different groups, and we found the vast majority are these white lines where the attack appeared to be deceptive. Someone was replaying an attack that a previous team had played. And so this sends the machine learning approach into a bit of a tailspin. It doesn't know what to do. It can't determine the difference. Now, from an intelligence analysis perspective, if we are looking at attacks, we would be thinking about what is special about this one? How is the modus operandi different? How is the attack employed? Can we look at timing information? Can we look at habits? Things outside the normal uh, examining payloads and signatures. So based on this, we came up with a combination of rule-based approaches and some techniques from an idea called argumentation, where you can, which are computational techniques that allow you to consider multiple competing hypotheses. And this is very important if you're dealing with deception because you have to consider the possibility that the person who's attacking you might be trying to deceive you in some way. And this is very important in cyber. So when we did this, we found that the accuracy nearly doubles in this particular experiment. The neat thing about it, though, is even if you say, well, that's still giving you around you know, 60 to 70 percent accuracy, the, another upside of this is by looking at an approach, the algorithm also provides you with a chain of reasoning as to how it concluded uh, the uh, answer it got for you. So, okay, if we're looking to attribute an attack, well, what about the attacker's intent? So here we see a nice tool, uh, GVDG, and this is a, a Russian hacking tool that allows you to generate custom malware on the fly. Um, if you ever decide to download this tool, be a little bit careful because the tool itself has malware in it, and it will start beaconing back to Russia when you run it. So we see here, though, in this, these checkboxes, we have a nice list of tasks that this can do. So I can very easily go into this and generate malware to carry out certain things, yet on the defender side, malware reverse engineering remains a difficult and lengthy process. Malware reverse engineers in many ways are working like intelligence analysts, and they're trying to put together the pieces to figure out what the malware was designed to do. A lot of human intuition goes into that. Well, one approach to deal with this is why not leverage ideas from cognitive modeling? Can we mimic this human intuition with a machine? And we've implemented cognitive modeling approaches for this problem. And what we found was something very fascinating. That the cognitive models would exhibit some emergent behavior. So for instance, let's say we have malware and it's packed and encrypted. So static analysis techniques would fail to extract any information. The cognitive model will by itself make the decision to use information obtained from dynamic malware analysis without us having to program that specifically. So if you could think of other sources of information that would then come and help this out, the cognitive model would start using what's relevant all by itself. So this is quite powerful. And we obtained some very nice experimental results. And uh, most recently, we were approached by a company called SightLock that wanted to have us help them use this technology to identify malicious HTML and PHP files as part of web security. 
And in some of these initial experiments, we are seeing that we're capturing most of the malware, so we're missing about 10% with this approach of the samples we've been looking at. And we're getting about also 10% false positives as well. And these are just initial trials, and we're continuing to work with them to engineer this. So, getting to the point that uh, Natalie brought up, is cybersecurity truly offense-dominated? My argument is that I think that only holds true if you assume you have no information about the adversary, if the adversary is a mysterious black box. Here we see some screenshots from the deep and dark web. Malicious hackers routinely buy, sell, and trade malware, exploits, and services here. So this information can be very important in uh, identifying what the next big thing is in cyber attacks and adjusting our security posture accordingly. So if we have an idea of what they're doing, is it then really offense dominated? If we're defending where they're trying to attack, if we are not using software they're developing exploits for, maybe we can avoid threats altogether. So, what's the current state of the art in this? Well, many big companies, particularly in the financial industry, realize that this is a useful source of information. However, there are uh, many firms out there, and many big companies also invest their own personnel in studying this kind of information, but still using a largely manual process, rifling through web pages, looking at results of web crawlers and this kind of thing. And this becomes very labor intensive, hence the expense is rather high. To make problems worse, the dark web is growing. Every law enforcement operation that occurs and you hear about a Tor site being taken down only serves to encourage more people to use these type of uh, protocols and utilities to create new deep and dark web marketplaces. The number of Tor sites alone has more than doubled in 2016. And we often have these spikes like here, where we see in February, that immediately follow major law enforcement operations. Going back to the human approach, though, if we continue to see this kind of growth, a human approach will simply not scale in the future. You're not going to get enough eyeballs on the screen. And what we're seeing is we're seeing big growth in countries such as Vietnam, uh, Brazil, we see a big move toward the dark web in Japan as well. And as more and more cyber criminals start engaging in this type of economic behavior, the more difficult it's going to be if you take a traditional approach. Here's an example of how this kind of information can be useful. In early 2015, Microsoft identified a remote code execution vulnerability in Windows. At the time, no one in the security community had any evidence that this vulnerability could be readily exploited and weaponized. In April, we found a piece of malware for sale on the dark web that claimed that they could exploit this vulnerability. In July, FireEye, which is probably one of the premier companies for incident response, identified this uh, exact exploit in the wild used in a major banking Trojan. Each, in 2015 alone, there were, there were over 15,000 vulnerabilities identified. What happens in most companies is they prioritize the vulnerabilities as they come in, and as new high-priority vulnerabilities are identified, ones that were previous low priority fall to the bottom of the list. This prioritization is done primarily through introspection of one's own systems. So if they're not considering the threat, and there was no evidence that, from the security community that the threat was working on this exploit, the exploit in Windows could have easily fallen to the bottom of the list. Understanding that the threat was looking to utilize this as a, as a cyber weapon would allow better prioritization based on what the threat is doing. 
So what we have done is we've devised a system where we, we are able to not only scrape these dark websites, but we extract entities from them, things about the individual selling these products, the products themselves, and so forth, and we put this in a unified database schema. And so what this achieves here is by being able to extract this information, we can build upon other layers of analysis to provide insight into what's going on in the universe of the threat. So for instance, we can do economic analysis. So here we see uh, uh, these box plots are for individual Russian hackers. And what we see here is the price at which they're selling products by. We can do this by time. We can do it by market. We can look at the spectrum of individuals. Is this new thing they're offering for sale? Is it outside the norm? This can give us insight into the legitimacy of products for sale. Likewise, we can do social network analysis. We can see which vendors have presence on multiple sites, which malware and exploit vendors are working hard to establish reputation. And again, this also provides insight into where these communities are going. What is the new hot thing in, in the uh, exploits and malware uh, ecosystem? Likewise, we can also categorize our products and we can look at which vendors are specializing in certain categories. And what we've started to see over time is that particularly, particular malware and exploit vendors start to become more highly specialized and find their niche. So anyway, uh, that concludes my talk. But uh, again, uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, and if you want to learn more about what we're doing, uh, either contact me through ASU or through my company, IntelliSpire. Given that a lot of Tor sites are also legitimate and are on the dark web for other reasons than malicious ones, do you have any data or indication of how many of those sites that you listed and how many of those spikes were due to malware or other threat-related dark web sites as opposed to the innocuous ones or the ones that are beneficial? On the overall Tor universe, yeah, we don't differentiate that out because we are not crawling all the Tor websites. But in the world of malicious hacking, I mean, we, uh, we do see a significant growth in hacking websites. Um, mainly it's due, uh, we think it's mainly due to the increase in proliferation of uh, malicious hacking, increases in education in certain countries, and also a lot of it is due to uh, individuals who write malware and exploits not being able to find a market within their home country as well. And what do you base that on, beyond your intuition? We're actively crawling over, well, we've, we're actively uh, crawling over 150 uh, deep and dark web sites that specialize in malicious hacking, and we're constantly discovering new ones on a weekly basis. So uh, I don't have numbers to show, but I mean, we're, it's, pretty uh, solid on this. For the 10-10 number, so 10% of unidentified and 10% false positives, can those be refined by humans? So if, we're hum if humans were to take those 10 unidentified, per that 10 unidentified percent, are they able to do analysis themselves and identify where they are? Or is it outside the scope? Yeah, so that's actually what we're working toward with SiteLock on that, is the idea is to help them significantly triage uh, the suspected malicious HTML and PHP code, because right now, uh, to rifle through that without doing any triage ahead of time becomes uh, a very manual and labor-intensive process. If this continues to be successful, where do you see this evolving to in the next several years? Um, I mean, by this, uh, what are you... By the, the research technique. Well, is, I is it peaking, or do you see this as having the potential for getting further than where it's at right now? I think it has a lot of potential for getting further. I think that... Um, I think there's two elements that haven't yet become mainstream in cybersecurity in both research or uh, industry, and that is, one, is an intelligence centric approach where you're looking at the threat. And I think we're going to see more demand of people who 
have skill sets where they understand cyber, but also understand uh, socio-cultural and uh, linguistics about different uh, communities. And then two, I think the intersection of cybersecurity and data science and machine learning, having people who have both of those skill sets, uh, as we train more of those people, um, we're going to uh, see a, a lot of, I think there's going to be a paradigm shift in the future toward a more uh, data-centric approach to cyber. So I think what we're seeing, what I'm showing here is the, just the beginning. How can companies be more proactive when dealing with, say, attackers and the dark web going forward? So that's a good question. Uh, there are many ways to use information gathered about the threat. So first, as I showed in the example, if you see that a specific vulnerability is being targeted, you can now prioritize that vulnerability to the top of the list and patch prioritization. And that's not a small thing because the amount of vulnerabilities identified is, is not only large, but it's growing. So prioritization is really important. The second thing is if you have an understanding of where development is going within the malicious hacker community, it can also help drive things like purchase decisions. So if you know a particular piece of software has, is a uh, focal point for the malicious hacking community, you could maybe avoid using that piece of software or hardware altogether. And so by making these more strategic decisions, uh, it leads us to the possibility of avoiding certain types of attacks altogether and not even having to deal with detection or remediation. Thanks. Do you have any concerns that this technology can be used by countries such as China or Turkey or Iran to go after political dissidents? I think that uh, in general, yeah, I think definitely. And I think most of these players are already using data science and machine learning to go after uh, dissidents as they are. With regard to what we're working on, we've taken an approach with the dark web where we're focused entirely on malicious hacking and the exploit market. There, uh, and I think what we've been doing in, in my group is sort of going to be indicative of kind of the next generation of dark web research. So there's been a lot of dark web research that started maybe about five years ago, when especially when Tor was a lot smaller in size, and they would focus on pretty much any type of criminal activity on Tor, you know, looking at everything from human trafficking to, um, uh, to crime to drugs and so on. But as it's grown, I think it makes a lot of sense to become more specialized in different criminal domains in gathering this information. So I don't think our technology in particular could be used for that because we haven't designed it that way. 